Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. From AMI Central. Now circling in the neutral zone. Here's the pitch on the way. 36 yards for the win. This. Here comes a big chance. The shot is, is this the tagger. The neutral zone. Oh, it's oh my God. This is as good as it gets. Now, here's your host, two-time Paralympian, Rock Richardson. What's going on, my friends? It's time for another edition of The Neutral Zone. I am indeed your host, Brock Richardson, and I'm alongside Claire Buchanan. Claire, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's another beautiful day, and we get to uh, chat sports together. It's one of my favorite days of the week. Yes. Used to be Fridays when we got to do this live, and I never thought I'd say this, but Monday has become my new favorite day of the week, even though we released the episode on Tuesday, which is... A close second to my favorite day because you guys get to see the wonderful content we put out for you. And also joining us is Josh Watson. Josh, how are you? I'm doing well, Brock. It's been a bit of a quiet day, but that's kind of nice. We were all in uh, Brantford on Saturday for the Ontario Blind Sports Association Hall of Fame Gala, which was a lot of fun. You did a fantastic job, sir. And so it's kind of nice just to have a day to relax a little bit and just focus on talking sports. Yes, it was a wonderful thing to be a part of, the Ontario Blind Sports Gala. It was my first opportunity emceeing by myself. Uh, the first time I did it, I did it alongside Kelly McDonald, who is the host of Kelly & Company weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern uh, on AMI-audio. And yeah, it was just a lot of fun and really enjoyed it. Congratulations to all the uh, inductees and award winners, and I'm thinking we might have a person or two from the night uh, join us down the line, probably into the new year, I would suspect, knowing that I'm the producer and the schedule is looking pretty tight between now and our last episode uh, before Christmas. So with that, we're going to jump into our headlines. Neutral Zone Headlines. 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 A big congratulation goes out to the Canadian women's sitting volleyball program. They captured their very first medal at World Championships uh, recently. The men did not reach their quarterfinals. And I want to have a follow-up from last week. We now know that the Brooklyn Nets have picked their head coach, Jacques Vaughn, who was the intern coach, when Canadian Steve Nash parted ways with the organization. He had some interesting things to say on his first press conference. I might not have been their first choice. In fact, I might not have even been my wife's first choice. But hey, my wife and I have been married for 20 plus years. So maybe this will work out. So Jacques Vaughn with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek response to uh, the Brooklyn Nets press conference. You gotta love a coach with some humor. The senior women's national wheelchair basketball team played a four-game series against the Netherlands this past week. In the first game, they defeated the Netherlands 75-73. Game 2 saw the Netherlands come out on top at a score of 73-53. The last two games of the series were not posted on social media at the time that we recorded this episode, but we know from one of the members of the team that they played the under-23 national Netherlands team, and the third game was won by the Netherlands, but the score is not known, unfortunately. The fourth and final matchup saw Canada victorious at a score of 53-42. to When all is said and done, the series was tied two games apiece. Congratulations to both sides on a well-played series. Ontario athletes came out on top at the recent wheelchair tennis nationals, where Anne-Marie Dolanaire struck gold twice, taking home first place finishes in singles and doubles matches for her first time in her career. Candace Comden also set personal best finishes with a third place in the singles events and matching her best in doubles, finishing with second overall. Congratulations to all of the athletes that competed in Montreal at Nationals and looking forward to the next upcoming season. Those are your headlines for this week. It's time to check on our Twitter polls. Last week's question was, are you happy with this year's World Series champion, the Houston Astros? 60% of you said no, 40% of you said yes. This week's question is, who is your pick for this year's Grey Cup? Winnipeg Blue Bombers or Toronto Argonauts? You can cast your votes at our Twitter handles coming at you right now. 
And welcome back to the Neutral Zone AMI broadcast booth. And we are set to get this ball game underway. The first pitch brought to you by Brock Richardson's Twitter account at Neutral Zone BR. First pitch, strike. And hey, gang, why not strike up a Twitter chat with Claire Buchanan for the Neutral Zone? Find her at Neutral Zone CB. And there's a swing and a chopper out to second base right at Claire. She picks up the ball, throws it over to first base for a routine out. And fans, there is nothing routine about connecting with Cam and Josh from the Neutral Zone. At Neutral Zone, Cam J and at J Watson 200. Now that's a winning combination. And this Oregon interlude is brought to you by AMI Audio on Twitter. Get in touch with the Neutral Zone. Type in at AMI Audio. Katie Mitchell, our guest today, is the physiotherapist and athletic therapist for both the women's national para ice hockey team and the Ontario hockey team. Katie is also in the midst of completing her PhD, which deals with concussions from Wilfrid Laurier. Katie, thanks so much for joining us from Waterloo, Ontario. Thank you so much for having me, Brock. It's great to be on the podcast. We've been really excited to have you on. Uh, can you start off by giving us a little insight on what sparked your interest in getting your PhD in concussion specifically? Um, well, I can say that when I became a clinician, I had zero intention of doing a PhD and then sort of fell into the, the hole of just like, ask. Well, I've worked in a lot of different sports and say I've worked in para sports since 2013, but I've also been in a lot of upright sports like um, rugby and hockey as well. Uh, and so I've been, I've witnessed a lot of scenarios of like, concussion management and concussion injury and dealt with a lot of different like contexts and stories with that and obviously barriers with that. And so um, if I kind of rewind to the start of when I approached my current advisor for um, even about the research he was doing, it was in 2015. So even then the landscape was completely different like seven years ago. Uh, with how we manage a concussion injury as well. So a lot of the protocols have even evolved since that time. Um, but there was just so many gaps uh, in the management protocol and I had so many questions that I wanted to address. And so it kind of lured me back in uh, after speaking with him and he convinced me to return to do some research at uh, Wilfrid Laurier. Now, you mentioned that you've been involved in parasports for a while. How did you become involved with the Canadian National Women's Program and Team Ontario? Uh, again, that takes me back uh, probably to around like 2013 as um, a phys physiotherapy student. Uh, I volunteered to be medical for uh, the Ontario Parasport Games in Kingston. I went to Queens. And so at that time, uh, I was, I was matched up with another sport physiotherapist. And she happens to also be very much involved in the para hockey world and was working with Ottawa, a club team in Ottawa at the time. And so they had a game in Kingston uh, just randomly and she couldn't make it. So she invited me to cover for her. And so that was, yeah, I think in 20, late 2013. Uh, and then from there, I think there was just kind of, you know, a posting for STO, the Ontario team. And I decided to cover a camp and just give that a shot. And then I just kept coming back <laughs> and getting invited back to those camps. And then in 2018, the the lead therapist at the time was leaving and he emailed me and offered me the position to take kind of over for him in 2018. Uh, and obviously at the time, even I think in that season, Claire was around as well. And so I got to know a lot of the uh, women's team players, uh, including like Christina Pickton and some others who were, you know, pioneers in that sport. And so over time, I think I just became more well known in the sport and, and actually the way I got involved with the women's team was just kind of speaking to the coaches at the most recent national championships that this event, um, the most recent, the world challenge uh, where Claire got that cheese head from in Green Bay. Uh, and so they invited me to, to help out with that. So it was kind of just the, you know, sequence of events, the way the cookie crumbled. Um, but obviously like I've always been drawn back to it and I'm really passionate about uh, working in the sport. I think a good place to start besides uh, your history in, in concussions and, and working with athletes is to just go over what a concussion is and, and kind of what that entails before we go into deeper detail. Yeah, of course. So concussion is essentially a functional brain injury. So it's not something that will turn up on a scan like a, a CT or an MRI, really like a brain bleed, for example, uh, with a more traumatic injury. 
you consider that it's a like really rapid deceleration of the head um, from either a direct or indirect blow to the head or the body. Um, you can think of that really sudden deceleration. The brain actually moves independently inside the cranium. So when you stop really abruptly and they have that sort of like whiplash mechanism of the head and neck, um, the brain is sort of shearing and moving inside. It's very fluid. So there's a lot of extra sort of like motion there. Um, and uh, you can imagine that all like the nerves and things that are, you know, um, all integrated throughout the structure uh, have sort of like a, a shearing effect as well. And so that affects their function, which really boils down to it, like I said, becoming a functional injury. It's more about the communication between areas of the brain becomes affected uh, from more of a transient sort of temporary standpoint. Um, but the timeline for that type of recovery or the re repair of the, the structures isn't very clear. We don't really understand uh, like when that will occur for each injury. They're very, um, very unique injuries. And so really it's all about restoring the communication of, you think of like the transmission in the brain and the communication between different areas um, for, you know, functioning, at, especially for an athlete at a sport competition level or like I call sport mode is, is a, a lot more demands than sort of an everyday general activity. So um, it is, it is very complex, but also very interesting. And obviously I've committed a lot of time to studying it. Now, this next question is probably then hard to answer based on what you've just told us, but we do understand that each situation is going to be different and there are many different, uh, factors to consider, but with a concussion, how much time generally should someone be taking off of sports? Yeah, that is that is a really tough question. That's part of what I've spent so much time trying to figure out of how to best kind of quantify when we can say that um, or give sort of an idea of like, you know, if you can do this thing, can are you prepared to go back to sport or, um, you know, work or general life? And so uh, you are correct. It's, it's a really unique, um, like very contextual, like it's a lot of different factors uh, that pertain to each person. Um, but certainly like within a, the protocol now, um, sort of our, we call clinical recovery or recovery of symptoms from like a general standpoint in the protocol, uh, for adults, it can be like two weeks to a month. And for most children or youth, it would be about a month is an expected recovery kind of beyond that becomes more of a persistent or prolonged recovery. Um, that I know, like, even with the most recent consensus, like there likely will be some different recommendations coming out. So, um, we'll have to wait for that to be published though, to share, to share that information. So once the contact has been made and the impact, uh, of the athletes have been felt, what are some of these symptoms that you are first looking for when seeing or trying to evaluate if a concussion, uh, has happened and, and kind of what the next steps are? Yeah, so that's uh, that's another great question, and I think I've just been in the like in the game, I guess, for so long that I can pretty much my radar is like pretty good. I would say I'm pretty accurate, even of just like seeing something unfold, say on the ice, and you know just approaching that player when they hit the bench to be you know just have a discussion real quick. Um, it's especially with para hockey, you know, it's just like the impacts, you, you just like hear them and feel them more because of the equipment as well. Um, but I think they're just more obvious perhaps too that like, you know, if anyone sustains something like that, I'm going to probably just quickly ask some questions. And so typically those initial questions um, involve, you know, do you have any like dizziness or lightheadedness, um, you know, feeling any pressure or even just like a focal kind of headache uh, sensation um, it tends to feel more like a generalized sort of like pulsing or pressure immediately after. Um, but from a dizziness standpoint, it can even be like a very brief, like, oh, I just felt it for like a quick couple of seconds there after that impact and I just shook it off. And it's like, oh, that's probably just, you know, that old saying of getting your bell rung isn't really acceptable anymore that we know that those symptoms can return later. So um, even just a brief incident of that, I tend to... Um, examine further and like a, a dressing room assessment. Now, if we take a look at concussions in parasport specifically, does an individual's disability play a factor when diagnosing a concussion and also in bringing an athlete back to sport in a safe manner? Yeah. And that's a, that's an interesting topic right now after the 
consensus meeting in Amsterdam, that was the first time they talked about parasport in its own individual session. And so it really stirred up a lot of conversation about that. Uh, Cause particularly like there's different um, sort of the way they've categorized things now in the recommendations is um, basing it on sort of like on the classification criteria. And that sort of helps sort of identify criteria for someone's disability. Cause there can be overlap, obviously, um, even if, you know, it is a specific disability, there could be, you know, um, other things that overlap with something else. So for example, like low vision athletes, like, uh, for Alpine skiing or for track and field, there's, um, blind athletes. And so there's obviously different considerations for them because a lot of the current protocol doesn't apply to people with low vision because a lot of it is, um, requires vision to do a lot of the assessments, um, and then like also for like impaired muscle power for example so that could be someone with a spinal cord injury or spina bifida or other types of disabilities that um that if they can't say perform like say like um a, one of the common like coordination tests would be like a, a finger to nose task and so if someone doesn't have full function of their upper extremity to do that they they can't be assessed that way um and uh another one would be like balance for example so someone with an amputation we're not going to be able to um perhaps measure their balance the same um, or someone who uses a wheelchair. So definitely right now there is a huge gaping hole in the protocol for accommodation of uh, athletes with disabilities in parasport. And there is a ton of opportunity to change that. So um, I'm really looking forward to the next four years and what comes out of that. But certainly like we don't have a lot of answers for how that impacts things now, but from my standpoint as a therapist with the team, I've already accommodated that with just really extensive medical forms, making sure I understand even, you know, common symptoms that someone feels because of their disability. So perhaps maybe they're taking a medication that um, causes them to have more frequent headaches, or maybe they get dizziness from time to time, or maybe different positions make them feel dizzy. So if I'm doing an assessment post-concussion, I'm going to consider that that person, maybe they even get double vision occasionally. Um, that, that could be something they've already experienced that may not be a, like a more indicative of a concussion diagnosis for me. Um, so I would consider those things every time. I can definitely tell you that every time I've done a concussion kind of baseline test, I, I cannot stand on one foot <laughs> at all. So, uh, yes, it's, it's good that we have minds like yours trying to adapt those protocols and kind of baselines for para-athletes specifically. Uh, moving forward to uh, now that you've assessed that there's a concussion with an athlete, um, does the disability that each individual have uh, play a factor in what that treatment plan looks like uh, to, to recover from the concussion? Definitely. Uh, one of the main things is energy cost of just like mobility. Um, an ambulation because one of the first things then that protocol is like rest and active rest. Um, so what does rest mean for someone who uses a wheelchair that is perhaps maybe expensing more energy to get around um, or with a prosthetic um, or assists different uh, um, gait assists. So that is the first glaring issue is that we don't know how to necessarily make those recommendations other than anecdotal anecdotally um how you know we've just found conclusions and adaptations for each individual but right now there's no real recommendations um other than that i was mentioning that uh recent the document by the concussion and parasport research group um or consortium group that i've recently joined um they have really highlighted key areas in that and so that return to sport protocol again like those kind of classification criteria of if someone has impaired muscle power or um, like I said, different modes of ambulation, or perhaps they have sensory issues that are pre-existing, like how do we rehab those things if they're already pre-existing um, or how do we accommodate those things? So particularly again, with like balance control, it's sort of my bread and butter is the uh, coordination and balance and um, sensory integration piece. So we're definitely starting to have conversations about how we can make adapted assessments and interventions. Um, but uh, fortunately it's not as widely, um, I guess like the education isn't as widely distributed right now to other clinicians. So a lot of it is kind of learn as you go. And then we're taking those experiences and trying to formulate more kind of, um, 
I guess, evidence-informed protocols uh, to move forward. We're joined by Katie Mitchell, who is the physiotherapist and athletic therapist for two para-ice hockey programs. She is also in the midst of her uh, PhD, which is investigating concussion assessment and interventions with athletes to better determine their readiness to return to sport and activity. I'm your host, Brock Richardson, alongside Claire Buchanan and Josh Watson. Katie, can you talk to us a little bit about the signs you look for when determining if an individual is potentially ready to return to play after a concussion? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, like obviously uh, with the initial signs and symptoms, like those will kind of dissipate over time. But we know that uh, the brain is still healing, even though symptoms have recovered. So relying purely on just like resolution of headache symptoms or dizziness or um, perhaps even just like even neck pain or things like that. We know that the uh, demands of like a sport, for example, are going to blow way past just that sort of baseline level. Uh, And so what I tried to do and a lot of my research has looked at is integrating like things like cognition. So adding cognitive challenges, like to um, use dual tasking where you're doing basically two things at once, um, which is very similar to sport demands. But then we'll also mix in some exertion testing too. So we'll do like, you know, bring heart rate up and then reassess like cognitive, uh, like decision making and um, to represent, you know, the state of which like an athlete would be making, you know, quick decisions and, um, you know, having us also use vision for things as well. Um, So that's what we look at is is, uh, kind of progressing those variables. So making things more challenging throughout the return to sport um, because really to follow the timeline, it's kind of like symptom resolution. And then you start doing some light activity and then you start kind of, you know, if you think of hockey, for example, you would maybe integrate some sport specific things like stick handling on your own and just kind of light sort of get your hands working again. Uh, And then you would build into that non-contact practice to a contact practice and getting cleared by a doctor. Um, So basically like my idea is to sort of, follow that progression, um, but to sort of mimic the demands of sport as best we can. And so my clearance tests are pretty tough. <laughs> they, they definitely get you up to, like I, tr- like I said, try to replicate a sports scenario as best I can to ensure that the athlete's actually ready to return to that. Um, and so typically like a lot of the uh, patients that I see anyways are, are usually fully prepared to sweat (laughs) and push themselves extra hard uh, when they come see me for that kind of clearance. We recently have been uh, covering this topic because the question of the standard of which uh, concussions and protocols have been uh, to return back to sport. Um, And it's you want it at a high standard rather than not. So to to put it at a high standard to get athletes back into uh, action is is better than than the the uh, the other end of it. So uh, you have recently been a part of some big uh, discussions uh, overseas, and uh, can you touch on uh, what those discussions uh, were all about, and and kind of what they are going to move forward in the future for concussions? Yeah. So I touched on it just briefly before with the uh, it was the international consensus on concussion in sport in Amsterdam, and this was just. Uh, Oh, it was, I guess, three weeks ago now. I've kind of lost track of time since returning. Um, but it was uh, it was a quick but also incredibly informative meeting uh, over a couple of days, uh, you know, entire full days of just discussion around all aspects of concussion in sport. Um, and this meeting is organized with the major governing bodies of sport um, across the world. So from everything from FIFA to IIHF to... Um, Formula One and um, again like the major they're all in attendance for that so there's this interesting dynamic of having some stakeholders there as well in sport not just researchers and also even the public were invited so um, you know there was an NFL player there there was um, you know a sibling of an NHL player who had passed away there's it was very interesting um, to hear just like the voices in that conference as well, um, not just sort of academic research, but the discussions are essentially like from that standpoint, this meeting 
produces the sort of consensus on concussion in sport, which is published typically every four years, but it's been six years because of the COVID-19 pandemic since 2016 in Berlin when they hosted the last meeting. Uh, and so they produce the document that is typically used to assess athletes. So that's the sport concussion assessment tool. Uh, which is in its fifth edition, upcoming will be the sixth. Um, so we make adjustments to that based on what the research has shown us and what you know is the evidence is pointing towards. So we try to progress that document to again, like challenge this the protocol more and make it um, more evidence informed, um, more applicable, more practical, and safer for athletes. So that tends to trickle down from not just those major organizing bodies, but to all the like kind of grassroots levels of sport and minor sports as well. Um, and like I said, this was the first time they included parasport as its own kind of independent session uh, that was led by the chairs of the concussion Square Port committee um, who are like, you know, there's uh, Sherry Blowett is an MD and Paralympian and she's a major party in that group. Um, she's at Harvard medical in Boston and, uh, she's fantastic advocate. Uh, they even brought in some athletes to like just basically talk about their experience. Um, there was a parallel alpine skier from Great Britain that was there. Uh, and so basically what comes out of this meeting is, like I said, the sort of advancement of the protocol and the best recommendations that we had kind of all bring our heads together and discuss and debate. Uh, and, and then another four years, we'll revisit everything again and, and evaluate and come out with a new protocol. Now, if people are interested in going to or being a part of any workshops or classes that you or anyone else might be a part of, how would they do that? Yeah, so I a lot of the education I provide is to uh, like other clinicians um, currently right now or even like student groups. Um, but certainly there is like free resources. Uh, there is one through the University of Calgary that is a very large concussion course that's freely accessible um, to anyone who wants to take it. It's called the MOOC, I believe, M-O-O-C. Um, I think they are they kind of release it through cohorts, so um, you can always keep an eye on that one for a really great resource. But certainly there are like kind of open forum type conferences that are held, some universities host events. Um, but certainly like even just like listening to podcasts like this are a great way for me to kind of share that type of awareness and education. Uh, but uh, currently until I kind of wrap up my PhD, my, my sort of capacity is thinned out on how much I can offer at the moment. So um, I try to take these kinds of opportunities as often as I can to share uh, with the public. Where can people go if they want to learn more about concussions or in concussions in sports specifically? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, there is the like big massive. It's literally called like the massive open course on concussion. I think that's what MOOC stands for uh, from the UFC. So it's a huge, uh, huge endeavor that they put on. Uh, but I also send people towards Parachute Canada is another great resource that people can look up um, the protocols and different education resources there. Um, and certainly, um, you know, even just through their sport organizations, if they're a member of like say minor hockey or something or club hockey, um, there should be some sort of resource available through that, um, especially with youth since the Rowan's Law legislation has gone through, it's required. So if there's any question towards that, I would be kind of leaning on to the administration of your uh, uh, sport organization. Um, but, uh, certainly like I've done some work in the past with say, community organizations to share like online courses, especially during the pandemic, um, when we couldn't host in-person webinars or, or sorry, webinars, but in-person seminars, uh, to, uh, just educate parents and, and athletes and different stakeholders to kind of know, like, what do you do, um, after maybe you suspect you've had a concussion, uh, cause obviously that's uh, a huge huge step first is just the recognition and acknowledgement of it and then figuring out what's the first step that you take uh, with that. So um, yeah, like I have resources even on my website that we can share as well, like to those links and different um, publicly available resources too. Awesome. Can you just uh, throw out your website for us? Sure. It is thriveneurosport.ca. Katie, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this interview. We were looking forward to it, and uh, it was lots of great information. We appreciate it. No problem. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. Anytime. That was Katie Mitchell, who was talking to us all about concussions. And again, she works with the uh, Women's National Program 
and Team Ontario Para Ice Hockey Program. If you want to get a hold of us for this interview or any others we do, here's how you can do so. If you want to leave a message for the Neutral Zone, call now, 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to give us permission to use your message on the air. Let's get ready to leave a voicemail! All right, so I'm going to pull back the uh, Neutral Zone curtain. Here it goes. So... I pulled one over on one Mark Follow because when we were starting this segment, he said, I'm going to give you a bed to start this segment. And my response was, should I get out of it without even skipping a beat? <laughs> and he stopped and went, a what? <laughs> and it took him a second to figure out what it was I meant. So I love when I can do that to people catch them <laughs> off guard once in a while. Usually it doesn't happen because people are usually pretty quick-witted including one mark of Lolo, but this time i uh pulled one over on him that's just mean but but we love you mark we love you i just enjoyed pulling one over on you let's go back to the interview we just did with katie mitchell and she spent a lot of time with us which was really really um great because she gave us a lot of information on concussions and i have to say that one claire buchanan brought this guest to my attention and we've been talking about tua and his concussions with uh football and how that's kind of gone sideways so we brought this interview on and she did a wonderful job talking to us about concussions but with that we had a bit of a longer interview than we're normally used to on this program so i want to get your thoughts on this interview did we learn something that we didn't already know about concussions josh well for me i did not realize that there were international summits on the subject so that was very interesting to hear about her trip to amsterdam and everything that came out of that and that the protocols are actually updated by an organization every four years that was that was very interesting for me yeah, it's been really interesting, not only to get to know Katie over the years as an athlete, and uh, but you you said it perfectly, Brock. She's just a fountain of information and uh, just obviously passionate about um, getting the right measures in place to make sure that athletes are safe. She's she's worked in in so many sports, both para and in able bodied sports, and. She's she just wants to make sure that she's part of the process of making sure that athletes are playing safe and and recovering properly. And I can tell you that when I first met Katie, I was experiencing uh, migraines pretty consistently, uh, at least uh, monthly, sometimes weekly. And um, it was it was Katie that helped me uh, even after it had been over a year since my last concussion when I first met her and and still experiencing symptoms. She she was one of the a big part in um, just recovering properly and 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 knowing that uh, concussion symptoms can be lifelong and it's it's how you manage that and and kind of listen to your body and I think she she said very well very good as well that uh, as as soon as it happens like you you got to listen to your athletic therapist and it's 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 good that she we have a therapist like her that that put their foot down and say, no, like I, your safety is, is first and foremost. And sorry, you got to get your butt off the ice. Cause, uh, you, you just, you had a big hit. And so it's, uh, it's exciting to see what she is going to be a part of, uh, moving forward. Cause she's, she's just getting started, especially with, uh, um, finishing her PhD. Yeah, that's, we've had this interview, uh, raring to go for a while. We've just had to, uh, can you know convene schedules and what works for us and what works for Katie but when you're over in Amsterdam uh you know learning and doing seminars that's that's pretty cool that uh, takes a one... little precedence over us i think uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she loves us but i mean trip to netherlands let's be real yeah. um the one sort of thing that i took away from it which she didn't really outline but i had a concussion as i've mentioned before on the program 
And one of the techniques they used on me was they uh, took me out of my wheelchair when I had a concussion and they sat me on the floor and they had somebody on one one side of me, so the right side, somebody on the left side and somebody in front just in case I fell forward because I have zero upper body strength. So what they did was because it was so close to the Paralympic Games, they wanted to see if they could um, help expedite the process of my concussion. And what they did was they tipped me very quickly to one side of my body. So they went right and then straight back up again and then left and then straight back up again. And that was supposed to help, you know, expedite the process. And for me, I don't really know if it did expedite the process. I can tell you that it made me feel really, really nauseated at the moment, but it's interesting to hear the different sort of techniques uh, that different people use, and one of the things she said that made me kind of cringe was that you you hear the sound as a therapist, and you're just kind of like, we're gonna gotta go check that one out, and like, that is just wild, that she's so good at her job that she can tell just by the sound whether or not we need to investigate this as an actual concussion. Any uh, final comments from you on this particular topic, Josh? Just that I really appreciated her depth of knowledge, and I, I wish we had been able to to get to one of the questions that you had for her uh, that we talked about off air, which was uh, how do you remove somebody from a game? Because that was quite humorous, but uh, we'll have to save that for another visit, I think. Yeah. It was it was a quite humorous answer, and maybe when we get her back on the air uh, with us again, we'll we'll ask that question. But she's very feisty, and she doesn't put up with nonsense. So, uh, but she did give us a bit of detail, which will go down another day. Um, I want to discuss the CFL and the two semifinal matchups. So, BC versus. Uh, Winnipeg and Toronto versus Montreal. Uh, let's start with the West final. Josh, what did you take away from this game? From the West final, I really think that Winnipeg is proving to be the class of the division. They've been to the Great Cup and won it two years in a row now. Uh, I watched that West final and was really thinking that BC was going to give them a run for their money this year, and they just didn't. There were just there was no answer for Brady Oliveira. There was no answer for that passing game. Winnipeg just looks really, really strong right now. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what the Argonauts can put up to uh, to stop the uh, the Blue Bombers in the Grey Cup this year. Yeah, for a West final, uh, like you said, Josh, uh, we would have hoped for a a closer matchup and uh, kind of uh, the BC Lions putting uh, a little bit more pressure on on the Bombers. But, hey, we have a final with Toronto in it, and uh, we we shall see uh, how Toronto does. And uh, it'll be interesting because uh, Winnipeg definitely, I think, comes in with a little bit of an edge on them just with more recent experience and and some I guess more more of their roster has more experience with recent experience in the uh, in in the Grey Cup. So and now I'm excited to watch it. We we have a Toronto team that is looking to go win a championship. So the it'll be exciting for the city. We don't get those a lot here in Toronto. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't. That's why <laughs> that's why we have to live vicariously through Winnipeg because. Uh, you know they they've proven to be uh, the the class of the CFL really. Josh, I I do have a concern, and I want to know if it's if it's something or if it's nothing. I want to know Zach Kalaros. We saw him at the end of the game get his ankle taped up. He did come back, uh, but if that Winnipeg team doesn't have Zach Kalaros. Do you see there actually being a chance for another champion, or do you think the depth of Winnipeg can still show through your thoughts? I think it all depends on the game, 
because if all Caleros really has to do is make a few passes and hand off to Oliveira, then I think he'll be fine on one ankle. If it ends up that it is really hampering him and he's not able to spend, uh, he's not able to stay upright, basically, if, if Toronto's defense can get after him, then I think it could play a factor because I don't recall who they have as a backup in Winnipeg, unfortunately. And that tells me that the backup option is probably not very good. But again, even if it is a backup, if all they have to do is pass uh, hand off to Oliveira, then it doesn't really matter who's at your quarterback, in my opinion. Fair. Claire? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I am a big person on defense winning championships. So that Toronto defense, if they can kind of put some pressure on on their running game and, and, and make their quarterbacks throw and, and have to get them uncomfortable, especially if you think that there's a, an injury lingering and, and have to kind of split that percentage of throwing and running the ball and, and kind of lean it heavily one way because of an injury. And especially in a, in a championship game, that's I think the Toronto Argonauts uh, would obviously be having that in mind and 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 basing a lot of their decision making around uh, putting that pressure on on the quarterback and and making them run. This is not an injury that you can hide if you are Winnipeg. I mean, sometimes you know coaches can say, "Oh, my ex player in this case quarterback has a lower body low lower body." Lower body injury, as I try to spit that out in English, as my tongue got completely caught up. (laughs) Lower body injury. And in this case, there is no hiding what this injury is because literally the TSN cameras went, look, it's Zach Kalaros getting his ankle taped up. Good luck. Yeah. Um, And so if you're Toronto, you are looking at this and you're saying, well, we know what the injury is and we know... We're going to have to make him move. And the way that I think you make him move is you say, well, we're going to cover all your downfield scenarios and we're going to make you move on that ankle and see how real wonderful it is for you. Because in this case, as I said, you can't hide this lower body injury. And I wanted to say lower body, in- lower body injury one more time just to say that I could get it out there. Um, and then I couldn't. Um, so, so that's, that's my take on this. I I think that Toronto (laughs) is in a world of hurt. I do not trust McLeod Bethel Thompson. I haven't all season. Yes, they are the top class of the East. There's no doubt about that. I'm just not sure that, you know, it is really a great top class of the East because all the other teams have had their struggles. They got back Andrew Harris yesterday, which was great. I think he's the difference maker um, for Toronto, but I would have to lean towards Winnipeg winning the Grey Cup quite handily, to be perfectly honest with you guys. What do you guys say about that, Josh? For me, I think Andrew Harris and his backup, Boulette, are going to be the the difference makers, whether it's in the passing game or the running game, whether it's screens or just, just flat-out runs. Andrew Harris runs like a bull in a china shop. There's just there's very very little chance of getting him down once he gets going. So if he's able to have a factor in the game like he should, then I think the Argonauts have a chance. I do still like Winnipeg in this game. I just think they're more well-rounded. But if you have a strong running back or running back tandem in this case as Toronto does, then it makes it a little easier on the quarterback because he doesn't have to be as good necessarily. Yeah, if Toronto can even out the uh, the kind of the passing percentage and and lean on their running game um, as much as they can, it's uh, it's a championship game for one. We we saw over the weekend that even in the last seconds of a game, uh, you you don't know where it's going to go. the The game isn't over until that last whistle blows. So. Um, don't take notes from the Bills th- th- this week. <laughs> That's for sure. 
Oh. Easy now, easy now. We're talking about CFL right now, okay? Let's but stay off the what football I'm to, right now. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that you never know what's going to happen in in any any game, let alone a championship game. So, uh, of course, uh, we hope that it's uh, a, a, a good fight and, and both the teams uh, come out playing uh, in the best ways that they can. But uh, we just touched on there. There's injuries and and stuff to factor in like that. So it'll be inter- interesting to see uh, how each team adapts to that and and uh, see uh, who takes advantage of, of kind of the downfalls. One of my uh, favorite things about CFL, but it, it's kind of awkward um, because it's one of those questions that every coach gets asked in the CFL of how they're going to approach their players in t- getting, let's say, some uh, intimate time with their significant others. And... For me, this is one of the most humorous things that doesn't matter what the coach is. Everyone says the first question is, how are you going to approach the topic of intimacy? And every CFL coach answers it with, I don't know, we're just going to talk about it and whatever they need to do, they need to do. But it is the strangest thing and it happens every year. And I just look forward to watching the uh, coaches squirm, Josh. Squirm. Yes, indeed. I I had forgotten about that. I thought that was a, a Super Bowl thing. But yes, you're right. It is a Grey Cup thing. And it is a tradition. I think it's the same uh, reporter that asks it every single year. Like you said, whatever a guy has to do to get up for a game, <laughs> do it. I mean, I, I don't want to know what these players do behind closed doors. It's not my business. Does it really yeah. matter? Like where... I, I understand that this is kind of like a uh, publicity and it gets gets everyone going. Obviously, we're talking about it here, but does it really matter? Is there is there where is the science behind these these comments <laughs> and, and questions? Because I don't think there is. I, any. Hey, just like any athlete uh, and any human, everyone's different. I think <laughs> who's to say that it affects everyone the same way? You know what I mean? So if if that's what you got to do, either to hold off from it or not, and and kind of like send your partner away for a weekend or whatever to to stay away. But hey, ev- every athlete trains for a championship game differently, so to each their own. I, that's it's wild that that's even a uh, a question from reporters. But of course, of course, it is. <laughs> it it has become a CFL Grey Cup question and now that we're talking about it somebody probably won't ask the question this year and then i just look like (laughs) a fool for bringing it up to you guys but i i'm reasonably certain it has become a standard tradition if you will um i want to go back on the cfl a little bit i want to talk a little bit about nathan rourke who was injured for the the vast majority of the season he got injured in the first third of the season with that knee injury and didn't return uh, until the last uh, game or two in the regular season and then played in the playoffs. If this is different, and I know we're playing this if game, but if this is different, do you think that Nathan Rourke has the more mobility to take on Zach Kalaros and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers? Or do you think this is a foregone conclusion either way josh i think nathan Rourke going up against winnipeg would be a more interesting game potentially but i don't know unless there was some kind of crossover scenario i'm not sure that they actually could go up against one another for a gray cup so it it certainly was interesting to see the difference between Nathan when he started this season and Nathan in that game uh, yesterday. It it he still looked like a great quarterback. He still did a lot of dynamic things, but he just didn't look the same as he did before. So it makes me wonder if he tried to come back a little bit early. But it certainly would be an interesting. Uh, interesting matchup for sure i don't want to sound like a broken record but again it this is a championship game so do you put someone in that might not look 
gray cup ready or do you kind of put your faith in in that person to uh, say okay uh, if you're feeling ready to be back and you've played a couple games and uh, it looks like you are feeling okay uh, that's a lot different than uh, are you ready to go play a gray cup so it'll be it'll be interesting to see both uh, to see how much playing time goes into goes into it and and what that what it produces yeah and that's the thing is that this year you know he's he's obviously not going to get the opportunity because uh it's you know he didn't win against uh winnipeg but it's just that interesting narrative of like yeah i agree they did sort of put him in a bit early i think that they know exactly what they have in nathan rourke and there's almost no doubt that he's going to get a look from an NFL team because of his talent. So the CFL, talking about injuries, is looking more at this in the sense of, well, he's a dynamic player. Is he ready? Can he give us 75%? Because truly, that's what I think he gave to the Winnipeg Blue Bomber game. I think he gave about 75% to 80% compared to the beginning of the year. And that can sometimes be not enough, especially when you're playing uh, against a dynamic team like Winnipeg who's been there done that got the Grey Cup uh you know uh and they just know what they're doing and they're going for their third straight uh overall so it'll be interesting to see what happens in this year's Grey Cup between Winnipeg and Toronto Argonauts one question for both of you and this is me ending the show a bit tongue-in-cheek do you think either of you (laughs) can complete a quarterback sneak at the end of a football game. <laughs> yes or no? Josh, go ahead. <laughs> well, it it depends on if I fit between my linemen, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know that I would have the guts to try, to be honest. It looks like being on the bottom of that pile hurts a lot. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think just be- I think I would have an advantage just because of my height. I think I'd be able to just find a smaller hole and get through it. And uh, I've spent most of my life trying to keep my hands on various sports equipment. And I've played basketball. I can handle handle basketball. And haven't ever played any football. But I feel like I could hold on to a ball for a couple seconds. Especially if I'm getting helped push through, like <laughs> you're, you got what a whole line of uh, 300 pound athletes trying to help you get through there. So <laughs> I agree. And for those of you that are like, "What are you talking about?" That's because Josh Allen completely screwed up a quarterback sneak when his defense made a wonderful <laughs> stand on the goal line, and then Josh Allen does Josh Allen things and can't hold on to the football. And be pushed forward by those in the set end zone too. Linemen. yeah, it's just <laughs> wild, just wild. Don't worry, I'm okay out there for you, listener, <laughs> listeners. I'm fine. I'm cheering for uh, the Miami Dolphins nowadays. It seems because I'm just worried about my Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Anyways, on that note, folks, that is the end of our show for this week. I would like to thank Josh Watson, Claire Buchanan. I'd also like to thank our technical producer, who you heard from just ever so slightly today, Mark Aflalo. And our manager of AMI Audio is Andy Frank. Tune in next week because you just never know what happens when you enter the neutral zone. Have a great week. Be safe. Be well. 